Good morning. I hate to break up such joyful chatter. Um, my name is Sam. I'm the associate pastor. I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, the first being that my vacation had nothing to do with the fire in my office. <laughs> I promise you. Oh, I, I figured most of you know. So, yeah, there was a fire in my office the day before I went on vacation. An airsoft battery exploded, and thankfully I was not in my office. Otherwise, I would have shards of copper. Um, so, that was awesome. Um, it got out, put out very quickly. Thankful to Corey back in the back there. Um, if you are a first-time visitor, go see Corey back in the back. He would love to give you a connection card and a gift. Just a way of saying thank you for joining us this morning. Our Next Sunday evening, July 30th, we'll have our church-wide come-as-you-are backyard barbecue. Um, we'll begin gathering at 5. Food starts at 5.30, and we'll wrap up around 8, 8.30-ish, depending on who's playing the guitar. Um, don't miss my maraca solo. Um, it's going to happen. Um, there'll be yard games. Um, we'll have some cornhole, um, some, I forget what the, is it Texas? Texas bags, I forget what it's called. Um, Dave promised some sort of game better than cornhole. I forget the name of it, though. But it's similar, throwing things into a hole, I'm guessing. Um, Dean Heitzman will be leading a jam session. And so if you bring your guitar, harmonica, bongos, kazoo, whatever you have to just share um, your musical talents, we'd love to have you. Um, and then... Our Burgers and Baptism will be Sunday, August 20th at 11 o'clock. Um, we're starting to get a list together for those participating. So even if you told us before, which I do have a list of those who told me before, but in case I missed you, um, if you plan on being baptized, come talk to us and we'll double make sure that you are on the list for that day. Um, and you can talk to Brian or Corey or call the office or talk to any of the pastors and we can get you signed up. Um, all right, our opening scripture this morning, oh, is going to be paused for a commercial. This is just a reminder, this week is the last week that you can um, take uh, some of the old altar cloths home with you and keep. They will be gone by next Sunday. We have a couple of the purple ones left and a couple of the green ones left. These were handmade by Marion Gebhardt about 70 years ago. So if you want those for a special event in your house or a memento, please take them. Um, also, we still have some of the little, um, not many shot glasses, um, Communion cups. <laughs> the communion cups from the Little White Church. These are the original glass communion cups that we used. We have a bunch of them, and they would be ideal for a small group um, communion. So those of you in small groups, consider maybe picking up enough for um, your own small group. Or they would make just ideal little rosebud holders for a special tray or event. Anyway, we have several of them. And the last announcement is we are looking for an additional hymn leader. Um, so if you would like to consider doing that, uh, we have enough that the rotation is once every eight Sundays, I think is, would be your turn. And the job is to simply select the two hymns, the closing hymn, and get up and lead them for the congregation. See me if you're interested in that. Thank you. All right. Brought to you by Florence Carlton Choir. All right. First Peter 3, 13 through 16. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. 
but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Let's pray this morning. Jesus, thank you for this day. As we come to you in worship, as Dave delivers your message, Father, please be with him that he will speak the truth, that we will be able to hear it and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Forgetting it's the yellow one. <laughs> All right, the first hymn this morning is number 262 in your hymnals. And so if you'd like to turn to that, you can, if you'd like to just follow along the music, please do. And you, and you can stay seated. So um, let's begin. Holy, holy, holy. All four verses. Thank you. That was good. All right. The second hymn this morning is Lift High the Cross. It's number 304 for those who'd like to follow along. And we will be doing verses 1, 4, and 5. Of Christ proclaim. <laughs> 
Okay, I'll be, I'll follow the order. <laughs> okay, it's favorite hymns now. And so um, I have a little bit to say about the first one. You don't have it in your, in your hymnal, and it's uh, Let There Be Peace on Earth. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the song since it's not in the hymnal. Um, it was written in 1955 after I was born. And... Um, by a young lady named Jill Jackson. And uh, she wrote this song after finding the life-saving joy of God's peace and unconditional love. She had been very suicidal. She was suicidal before she wrote the song and before God's peace broke through to her. So that's what caused her to write the song, the joy of God's peace is what caused her to change the way she thought about her life. So then in 2018, there was a pastor in Bennington, Vermont, um, who wrote little articles in their newspaper. And his name is Pastor uh, Bob Wiegers. He, he wrote that this song is powerful because it leads us to long for the true peace. That God brings and personalizes it. The only way to have peace in our world is to start with peace in ourselves. And it starts with the peace that God gives us. So that's a little bit of the history of, of this particular song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Okay. <laughs> on earth and let it be
the next one is number 425 in the hymnal. And um, it's called In the Garden, and we'll be doing verses 1 through 9. Our 1 through, I'm sorry, 1 and 2. My mind, I'm sorry, my mind is wandering. I was thinking about, I, I always have lots of stuff going on in there, and it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. All right, so I, I, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> One and two. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Brooke Thompson, and I'm a member of the prayer team. You know, the other day I was thinking about preparing a lead-in for our prayer time. I happened to be viewing a TV newscast with reporters relating the news of the day. The reports involved politics in which no one was happy and no one was seeking to work together. War news from various parts of the world, none of which was good. Natural disasters including oppressive heat and drought in some places much rain and tornadoes and others, nothing there very much encouraging. And people hating each other and people beating each other up and people shooting each other and other economic woes and totally polarizing cultural and social dysfunctions. You know, the list goes on, I don't have to tell you. There was even a story of a woman who required 51 stitches in her scalp after getting Get this, after being struck by the wingtip of a low-flying airplane. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you have ducked? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, Pete Wettendorf, who is a retired pastor and the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Bible Mission in Missoula, writes a few paragraphs each month in that organization's uh, uh, newsletter. Last month he encourages Christians to take a deep breath in view of all this stuff going on in the world and remember 
what is our focus or should be. He directs us to Psalm 105, verses 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing praises to him. Tell of his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Pete goes on, in these confusing times, how important it is to stay focused on godly things. In this psalm, we are encouraged to be thankful, to make known the Lord's deeds, to sing his praises, tell of his works, glory in his name, rejoice in him, and seek his presence continually. The psalmist never once mentions the trials of the day, but focuses only on the goodness of God. You know, I think that's good advice. We need to be less consumed by the dysfunction of our world and more centered on the glories of Christ, seeking his presence continually. One way we do that, of course, is through prayer. And remember this important truth. Evil never has the last word. Our God reigns. There, I feel better now, don't you? <laughs> well, here's our prayer list for this week. It's a short one. Um, Stiflers wrote earlier that they have a neighbor whose son has a congenital shoulder condition and uh, it has taken uh, several operations to repair and it's still not done. And he's going to go in uh, uh, soon and have more work done on that. So I don't know uh, this person's name, but he needs our prayers. So we put him on our, on our prayer list. Okay, we'll go to prayer now. First, pray silently. This might be a good time to uh, clear the slate, so to speak, with our God, or pray for personal needs, or for special situations known only to you. I'll give you plenty of time, then I'll pray, and we'll close together with the Lord's Prayer. Please join me now in silent prayer. Our all-powerful all and loving God, we come to you today thankful that you are sovereign. We, we rejoice in your grace as we view the troubling morass of circumstances and endless suffering that secular wisdom has brought into our world. Lord, we pray for your continued presence in our lives as we seek to focus on and follow you. Without your grace, Lord, we would be locked in hopelessness. But with your grace, we can see through it to the light of you and your eternity. And Lord, even though we live in a fallen world, we have much to be thankful for. The beauty of, the, of your creation surrounds us. You have placed us within a nation that with all of its recognized flaws is the envy of the world. We are among a body of believers who seek to serve both you and us within this church and in our community and beyond. And thanks for the sacrifice for us that you made that enables us to enjoy you both now and forever. We're grateful that we can worship you without fear. We pray for your blessing and guidance for our governmental leaders at all levels, that they and we will bring honor and glory to you in every decision made and every action taken. Lord, we thank you for this church, for those who lead, for those who serve, 
and for those who use their gifts and talents to bless each of us and further your kingdom. Lord, there are those among us who are on our hearts and minds whom we wish to lift you for your special presence in their lives. We pray for the neighbor's son of uh, Dennis and Susan, soon to undergo shoulder reconstruction, surgery, and treatments. We pray that they will be effective and correct the, the, the problem that they are uh, to work on. There are others, Lord, although unmentioned, are known to us, both personally and privately. We lift them all to you for your special touch in, the, in their time of need. We lift them uh, knowing that your power, in your power you will give them exactly what they need right now, healing, encouragement, proper treatments, hope, better circumstances. We believe in your miracles, Lord, in these lives as well as our own. And we pray that in these situations you will make your present presence abundantly felt, your will accomplished, your name glorified. So hear our prayer, Lord, for it is your in your name that we pray, knowing that you have given yourself that we may have abundant and eternal life in you. Please join me, folks. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It's good seeing you this morning as we, uh, uh, as we are here. I think we're going to get 100 today, aren't we? Isn't that awesome? It's all a matter of positive thinking. Just remember that. It's all a matter of positive thinking as we get there. All right, let's jump into this, uh, uh, where we are. We are uh, still in this series as we're walking through the book of Ephesians, Dear Ephesus, the title. Paul's letter to them, the Romans, uh, uh, theologians have said, if you want to talk theology, read Romans first. If you want to know how to live the Christian life, read Ephesians first. That's, uh, so, so that's sort of the, the backdrop for this thing as we, lo as, as we look at it. And it's important for us to remember today especially that the letter to, of Ephesians, the letter to the people at Ephesus, was written to the church. This was not a letter that was read on the town square. This wasn't a letter that was circulated among the population at large. As Paul writes this letter from Rome back to Ephesus to, talk to, uh, to, to share with those people, he is writing to people who believe in Jesus. They believe with all of their heart to their detriment within their culture, you know, you know, they lose money because they are Christians, okay? They, uh, they are shunned from the, from the latest dinner party because they are Christians. It's not popular for them to embrace this message of Jesus. He is writing to them, and that he is writing to us. When we read the letter to Ephesians, we should read it with that same vein. We need to remember that he's not writing to the people who are hanging out down at the Rustic Hut last night or tonight, you know. He's writing to you and to me. It's important to remember that distinction as we, as we, as we look at this book in general and specifically as we look at it today. Okay, remember where we are. The big picture of the first half of this thing, the theological upshot of it, 
We are not who we were. We are something different because of what Christ has done. No matter what we feel like, we are a masterpiece in the making. Don't ever forget that piece of it. Part of that masterpiece that the Lord is painting in our lives is giving us a different set of values, a different set of behaviors, a different set of attitudes through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can't gin these things up within ourselves by our own strength. In a, way, in a way that glorifies Jesus. Humility, goodness, gentleness, patience, forbearance, remembering that we are the gift of God to others in that best sense of the word, not in an egotistical sense, sense but in a, in a sense of humility that God uses us to affect people, people in their walk with Christ themselves. We are embracing God's past, path and abandoning competing interests. He's talked about that. In other words, Jesus is our light, and because we walk in his light, we become theirs, the reflected light of Christ through us into a world. That's our evangelistic call. And as we get into chapter 5 here a little bit, he's talking about how we live out being the light and live out that evangelistic call, not because, not, not because we're, getting, we're grabbing people at you know, walking up to their door and saying, have you said the sinner's prayer yet, but simply by being the light of Christ, others are naturally drawn to him, a moth to the flame, if you will allow it. So, with that in mind, let's move on through chapter 5. Five verses, six verses today. Hopefully we'll have fun with them. Paul writes after he says, you are the light of the world, that kind of thing. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Good advice, isn't it? So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are lanterns to the world. We are sages to the people. Let's consider what that means. You will let me, if you'll let me unpack that here after we pray. Heavenly Father, today, as we consider Paul's call to walk wisely and thoughtfully in the world in which we live, may we take up that challenge as God's people. That's all we ask in Christ we pray. Amen. So we're kind of picking this thing up where we are. Paul has called us to this life of sharing the good news of God as exhibited and demonstrated by Jesus. By this, this life of being the light. Now, as he talks about that, notice what he says here in this passage of Scripture. It's important for us to see this. It's important for us as the church to see this. Paul says we do this by living, living a life driven by genuine wisdom. And he describes genuine wisdom, he describes a, a, a wise life as beginning in thoughtful examination and culminating in worship. I've had several conversations over the course of the last month. It's been something that's really struck me as, a, uh, as I've talked with people about their faith. 
and, and, and the struggles in particular that people have had with, 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 with a walk with Christ. The common denominator in those, in, those, uh, in those conversations has been this. They have never been challenged to think through their faith. I've noticed that, and, that's, and, 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 it, and it struck me that that is one of the reasons we see the decline in faith expressed in our culture today. It's because we, as a body of believers, the great global church, over the last generations, for whatever reason, we haven't challenged each other to think through our faith clearly. I remember specifically one conversation that I had just a, just a couple, couple of weeks ago. It was a person who, uh, who, who grew up in, within the context of a, of, of, of a Christian fellowship, actually went to, uh, went to Christian school. But they were challenged to not think about faith. Just believe. Have you ever heard that one? Just all you gotta do is believe. Just believe. And you know that that that's somewhat what I grew up with. You know, because there was this great surrounding cultural tailwind for faith. We had this encouragement and support all around us as we as as we as we talked about Christ as we talked about God as we talked about living of a life that was pleasing to the heavenly father the life for which we were created everything supported that in our culture you know it it it, it wasn't until third grade that I stopped praying in school you know you know when i think about that somebody 10 years older than me Never got that support from an institution within within our within our uh, within our culture, and over time, one by one, the supporting pillars within culture, the tailwind that pushed us toward a faith in Christ, has gradually shifted to where now. People who are walking, walking with Christ are walking into the headwinds of culture. Are we not? That's a reality. Okay? That's not knocking them. Why are we, you know, I don't know why we expect culture to, culture to support us in this. Paul lived it out just like we are living it out now. We are now experiencing what the first century Christians experienced. They may not have, some of them faced legitimate existential persecution, all of them were walking into a culture that was, uh, that was by default skeptical of what they had to say and what they believed. That's where we are now. And what Paul called them to do in that context, who's he writing to? He's not writing to the city of Ephesus. Who's he writing to? The church. He's writing to us. He's writing to the people that are, that, 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 that are sitting right beside us today. Let's go back and look at those first verses again just so that we hear it. Be careful how you live. Don't live as fools, but as those who are wise. Don't act thoughtlessly in verse 17. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. Christian author Ergen Kainer said, An unexamined life is not worth living. An unexamined faith is not worth holding. The most underrated spiritual discipline for you and for me is the discipline of thoughtful examination of what we believe and why we believe it. And you and I have a responsibility to each other. One of the responsibilities that Paul refers to here is the responsibility to challenge each other 
to think deeply and thoughtfully about what we believe, why we believe it, and how it interfaces with the world in which we live. Because it's not easy anymore. It's, you know, when culture was the tailwind for faith, it was easy to find ways in which, in which our conversations about Christ or our behaviors in line with the, with the actions of Jesus. It was easy to find ways in which those would fit into the world in which we live. Ask any college student, ask some of our interns today. You know, they're, all, they're, they're off on a retreat this weekend, so you can't ask them this weekend. But sometime in August, before they take off, just ask them how, how, they, how, they, how they live their faith within the context of the college campus today, helping, you know, dealing with, ask them some of the questions they deal with. Ask them some of the things they have, uh, the, some of the ways they are required to express their faith in order to get it across with others. Folks, it's not, it's not bumper sticker Christianity that they are, they, they are trying to sell on campus because that just doesn't work anymore. They have, to, they have to thoughtfully express who Jesus is and why Jesus matters. They have to deal with a lot of competing cultures, a lot of competing ideas, a lot of competing gods, if you will allow me to use the first century term. They have to work at it. And one of the things that is required of us collectively as the wider church, not just Florence Carlton Community Church, but the wider church, is to begin to once again thoughtfully examine our faith so that we can, in the words of First Peter, give a defense for the hope that is within us. Folks, that's the challenge that faith faces us. It's the challenge that faces Paul. Remember Paul's personal life. Okay? When he says, don't act as a fool, but be wise. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants him to do. Remember that Paul was not born a Christian. Paul was not raised to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Until he, he, met, he met Christ supernaturally on the Damascus Road, he was one of the greatest opponents to this new faith that the disciples were talking about. He was, in, he was, he was actively engaged in eliminating the message of Christianity from the world in which he lived. Remember that. Paul was not, was not a believer from the get-go. He was, at, he, was, he, was, he was looking to destroy the Christian faith. And after he met Christ on the Damascus Road, he had to rethink a lot of what he believed in order to, in order to represent Jesus well in the world. Remember that he believed in all those Jewish laws, 613 of them. He, loved, yeah, he, he, he had memorized them. He lived them out. By the time you see the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, he, said, he, he is telling them none of that stuff matters. Do you think Paul came to that overnight? Do you think Paul had to, uh, had, had to allow the Lord to reshape him internally? He, he had to think through all of this stuff. What part of our faith matters? What part, of Je what part of what God is revealing through Christ jives with what I used to believe? And what part requires me to change? Folks, that's hard. That's hard, isn't it? And sometimes it's easier to turn our back on, on, on thinking through those things. Sometimes it's easier not to have those conversations. 
It's easier just to say, well, this is what I've always done, and I'm sure that the, sure it'll be fine. Let's just, let's just do what we do. Okay? Thoughtful examination from the ground up is important for us. Because looking, looking at people and saying, don't think, just believe, that doesn't work anymore. Truthfully, if we're honest about it, telling people don't think, just believe, has never worked. It didn't work 30 years ago. That's why people who didn't think and just believed, now that the cultural headwinds have changed, they are the ones that have fallen away. What Paul said here is essential. Don't think, just believe. Paul said, in order to believe. Think. In order to believe, allow the Lord to reason with you. In the words of Isaiah, go, come, come and let us reason together, the Lord said. When we do that, then faith will come. Folks, it concerns me. I, 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 I regret that we have set up generations for failure by encouraging them not to think. It is important for you and me to reverse that trend. Encourage the questions. Field them without judgment but without apology for your answer either. Allow, uh, allow people in this day and age, young and old, to ask the difficult questions. Thoughtful examination of who, what our faith means is requisite. Now, do you feel un unequipped for that? Most of us do, because most of us were not taught. We didn't have to walk that from the beginnings of our faith. We, we had that supportive community and that supportive environment. So in many ways, we have to learn to thoughtfully examine our faith, who we are, who Christ is, what that means. We have to learn how to jettison some of the some of the catchphrases that we've, that we've grown up with, and we've had to learn to, to, to define specifically what it means for an all-powerful, all-knowing God to at the same time be totally illogical. Did you catch that? Let me just give you a couple of nuggets for today because we have to learn to think this way ourselves in order to share it with others. Let me remind you of this today. Think on this this week, okay? Think on it until it blows your mind. And then let your mind come back together. If you need to call me, that's okay. Okay? Remember this. God is an illogical God. We have tried to define him in logical terms, right? He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. We've tried to use these, the, these, the, these logical characteristics and attributes to define God. And we have allowed, and we have then expected him to act in logical defined ways based on these logical defined attributes. And then we have trouble when he, do, when, when things don't turn out logically. How many times have you heard this question? If God can, God can control everything, why is there evil in the world? Anybody here heard that one? I hear that question at least once a week. Now that is a very logical question. 
if we are if we are thinking about the Lord in logical terms. But remember this, God is illogical. Or maybe to be more precise, God supersedes logic. Because the scriptures do not define him as, a God, as the God of logic, do they? They define him as the God of love. First John said, God is love. God is love. He doesn't say that he's absolutely logical. And therefore, God, therefore, he does illogical things. He is not bound by that. Does that make sense? You beginning to think about that a little bit? Here are some of the things that God, that God does that are illogical. Number one, he takes me. For some strange reason, which defies the logic of the universe, God wants to hang around me for eternity. How silly is that? Can I get an amen? God is not a logical God. He is a loving God. And that, that love for us drives him to do some things that don't make logical sense. He gave me free will, not because it was the smart thing to do. Don't laugh too hard. He gave you free will for the same reason, not because it was the smart thing to do. How many of us, how many of us can say, okay, yeah, Lord, why didn't you keep me from doing something stupid? <laughs> You know, you don't have to raise your hand. I already know the answer. He did not give us freedom because it was logical. He gave us freedom because it was loving. When we begin to think about our faith deeply, when we begin to give thoughtful examination, to God, who God is and why he is who he is and why he has taken some of the steps he has taken as a result, then things become, be, make, end up making a lot more sense. And we don't have people who are sitting there questioning bumper sticker Christianity anymore. There's compelling meat. There's a compelling draw. There's a compelling, using last week's term, there's a compelling light that, it, that inextricably draws them towards Jesus. Folks, I want to challenge us to begin to think deeply about our faith. It means we've got to let go of some things that we've always heard or at least allow them to be reshaped in our lives. Not because they're necessarily wrong, but because we have them in the wrong container. We've got to think deeply and communicate deeply about who Jesus is and what he did. I said I was going to give you a couple of nuggets. And... Uh, and then I'm going to quit because this sermon has turned out nothing like I planned it. Think deeply about the illogic of a loving God. The other thing I want you to do is remember that prayer that we just prayed. Remember it? Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven. You can go ahead and say it with me again. Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus taught us to pray that way. How long has it been since we have thought about the meaning of the words we just spoke? How long has it been when, since, you, since you sat there and said, Lord, glory to your name. What does that mean in my life? How do I do that? Your kingdom come on earth as in heaven? What in the world does that even look like? And how in the world do you use me to bring that about? I th I, I, in preparation for this, I started thinking about some of that stuff again because I'm just as human as everybody else here. I haven't thought about it in a while. But it was time for me to start thinking about that again. You know how many times in those, in those thoughts and in that, in that musing this week, I have said these three words, I don't know. Lord, what does this mean? I don't know. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Lord, what in the world does that mean for me? I know some of it, but man, there's, there's a lot here that doesn't, doesn't compute for me. What is that? How long has it been since we have examined deeply those things? How long has it been since we have asked somebody in our small group or somebody at the table while we're having coffee or just somebody in a phone conversation? You know, I've been thinking about this. What does it mean as a follower of Jesus? I had the privilege. Many of you will remember uh, Steve Arna. Uh, 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 you know, Steve passed away a couple of years ago. One of the most brilliant people I have ever met. Steve did the privilege, gave me the privilege of walking with him some when I first got here. Steve was worried about my physique. And, uh, and, he, and he, was, he wanted to make sure that I got out and got some exercise. So he would make appointments with me to go walking. We'd meet at the bottom of Wagner Lane, and we'd start up the hill, and he would graciously go until I wore out, and then we would walk back down. Steve never said hello to me. We would get out of the cars. I would wave. He would put his hand up. I'd get close enough, and he would start talking, and the sentences always began the same way. So, David, I was just reading this, and I want to get your opinion on it. And he would immediately engage in a spiritual conversation about many things that were not spiritual. He read it in the New York Times. He read it in Time Magazine. He had, he'd read it in one of the books that he had gone through that, that week, you know. He was just voracious. For, he's forgot, he forgot more than I ever knew, you know. Steve engaged. He demanded engagement in thoughtful examination of faith. How does this fit with the world in which we live? That is our responsibility to each other. When I'm thinking about the Lord's Prayer and I'm sitting there going, I don't know. It's not my job to throw up my hands. It's, it, it is incumbent upon me to not just throw up my hands and say, I don't know. It's incumbent on me to walk into the office the next day and talk with Cynthia or Corey or Sam or somebody and say, hey, I was thinking about this. I haven't come to a conclusion yet. What are your thoughts? It's incumbent upon us to do that. When's the last time you asked somebody a question like that? Folks, like I said, this sermon hasn't gone anywhere that I thought it would. 
So I hope that you've heard something that you needed to hear today. Here's what it all means, and I think this does apply still. A gift of God is the ability to exercise wisdom with clarity and sound judgment. That gift of wisdom begins with thoughtful examination. And if it's carried out to its logical conclusion, it will end with worshiping the Lord God Almighty. This week, read Ephesians 5, 15 through 20 every day this week. Consider the contrast between a thoughtless existence and a thoughtful walk with Christ. What does that mean for your life? Just think about those two questions I posed to you this week. What does it mean to have an illogical God who is driven by love instead of logic? What does that Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us to pray really mean practically in your life? Discuss it with somebody this week. Don't wait for the opportunity to happen. Find someone and discuss it with them this week. We need to thoughtfully examine who we are and who Jesus is. So in a world where people are lost in the headwinds of culture, we can help them learn to navigate their way to the light. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you today to give us wisdom. Wisdom comes from recognizing that you are indeed God to be humbled and awe-inspired by who you are and by walking in Jesus' footsteps. Father, help us to think it through, especially in the difficult issues. Help us to talk it through with those that you've surrounded us with so that our faith in Christ might not just might might be greater than just a bumper sticker it is matured by your spirit so that it will draw others to him it's in Christ we pray amen okay our closing hymn is number 74 Majesty. If you want to stand, you can. <laughs>
God bless you as you go from this place today. May he use you to touch the lives of those around you. May you sense his presence in a deeper way than you ever have before as you think deeply and examine thoughtfully everything that God has given you. Thanks for being here today. Say hi to somebody before you take off. Have a great week.